Section 2. Wherein it is proved that the present judicatories of this national church are tyrannical in the administration of government and discipline. As every society in the world must have its own distinct government within itself, without which it cannot subsist, but must needs fall into confusion and disorder, so the Church of Christ is a society which must needs have some order and government within itself for its own preservation and support. And therefore the Lord Jesus, who is faithful in all his house as a son, hath not left his church destitute of such a mean which is absolutely necessary for her preservation and subsistence in her present militant state. He upon whose shoulders the government is laid, and who is, by his father's designation and appointment, king, of, king over Zion, the hill of his holiness, hath settled the order and government of his own spiritual kingdom. He has not left it to the arbitrary will and pleasure of men what model and form of government should be set up in his church. He has not left it to men to give laws unto his subjects in these things that concern them as they are as they are the subjects of his spiritual kingdom. Neither has he left it to men to give officers and ordinances unto his house according to their arbitrary will and pleasure. He has declared his mind concerning all these things plainly in his word. There he has told us what officers he has appointed in his house, and after what manner they are to be set over his flock and heritage. There he has also declared his mind concerning the courts of his spiritual kingdom, and all the office-bearers of his kingdom have their several instructions delivered them, not from men, but from him who is the only lord and lawgiver to his subjects, and it is upon their highest peril if they transgress them. Hence all the subjects of his kingdom are charged with the greatest solemnity in the following manner. Ezekiel, excuse me, 40, uh, 44, verse 5. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering in of the house with every going forth of the sanctuary. As for the officers of Christ's spiritual kingdom, the apostle gives us a roll of them, both extraordinary and ordinary. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. The extraordinary officers were apostles, prophets, such as endowed with the power of working miracles, gifts of healing, and diversities of tongues. But the scripture can, and now being completed, the church does not stand in need of any such officers. The ordinary officers set in the church are teachers, helps or deacons, who have the oversight of the poor, governments, that is, governors or rulers, by whom the elder that only rules is intended, by whom the only elder that rules is intended, the abstract being put for the concrete. As for the manner how these officers are to, uh, excuse me, as for the manner how these officers are to be given to the church, they must be set over her by her own choice, call and consent. Acts 1, verse 23, and Acts 6, verses 3 and 5, as well as Acts 14, verse 28. Likewise, they must be authorized and set apart unto their respective offices, Acts 6, verse 6, 1 Timothy 4, verse 14, and Romans 10, 15. The former respects their, their nomination and designation unto their several offices, and this belongs unto the whole church. The only... Uh, the, the latter, excuse me, respects their authoritative mission, and this belongs only to such office bearers of the church as have power and authority from the Lord Jesus for that effect. As for the courts of Christ's spiritual kingdom, these are either congregational elderships, presbyterial meetings, or synodical assemblies. As for the synodical assemblies, these are their provincial or national, and if the state of the church did admit them, o eumenical. We have the divine pattern and warrant for such assemblies, Acts 15, with Acts 16, 4, uh, verses 4 and 5, excuse me. With respect to presbyterial meetings, the divine pattern and warrant is very plain for them in Acts, 8, uh, in Acts 13, excuse me, verses 1, 2, and 3, where we find several teachers or ministers of the word joining, uh, jointly ministering unto the Lord, and at his commandment and direction exercising acts of jurisdiction, verse 3, as also the name presbytery is expressed in scripture, 1 Timothy 4, verse 14, holding forth a society or body of elders associated together for the exercise of government and discipline in the church. Our Presbyterian divines have at the same have made the same thing evident from the churches of Corinth, Jerusalem, Ephesus, etc., which were Presbyterial churches under the inspection and government of their pastors and elders associated in a Presbyterial capacity. I refer the reader to their writings, particularly to the form of church government, received and approved by this church in on 1645. 
I shall only further observe upon this head, that presbyterial courts appear to be, in a proper and strict sense, radical judicatories, as is evinced by the reverend and worthy author of The State and Duty of the Church of Scotland, etc., published anon, 1732, page 95, for the following reasons amongst others. First, quote, a church session or congregational eldership supposes and implies a presbytery as morally necessary towards its erection and the ordination of its constituent members. Without whole ordination, that session could not in an ordinary way have been erected, and without a presbytery previously existing, these, its members, the ministers and elders, could not have been ordained. Secondly, a synod, provincial or national, is so far from pre-existing a presbytery that it supposes and implies in its very nature and constitution the pre-existence of presbyteries as the matter of its being and erection." Unquote. With respect to congregational elderships, the divine warrant for them is concluded by just and necessary consequence from several places of the Holy Scriptures, as, for instance, when there is mention of a plurality of churches in the one Presbyterial Church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians 14.34, as likewise where there is mention in the, of the church in such a house, Romans 16.5, 1 Corinthians 16.19, Colossians 4, verse 15, and Philemon 2. As these churches were single congregations, so the London ministers do well observe that these single congregations have the name and nature of churches, and therefore behoove to have the ordinary standing officers that are set in the church, that is, pastors or teachers, governments or elders, ruling well, and helps or deacons. And if such single congregations have the ordinary standing officers, they must needs have likewise the power of rule and government for the edification of the body of Christ in matters peculiarly belonging unto them, and which in ordinary cases, according to the rule of the word, fall under their immediate cognizance in these single or particular congregations. With respect to that power and authority that belongs to the several courts of Christ's spiritual kingdom, I shall not take upon me particularly to define or determine it, only it is not a mere consultative consultative power and authority, when no more is given under the courts of Christ's spiritual kingdom, the authority of the king of Zion is not represented or manifested in them. They are robbed of the keys of dis the key of discipline, which is given by the Lord Jesus to the office bearers of his house. They have no censuring power with respect to heresies, scandal, and obstinacy, if their power is only consultative. The censures or reproof the censures of reproof admonition, suspension from sealing ordinances, and excommunication cannot be inflicted by the several ecclesiastical courts above mentioned, though the power of censure is very necessary for preserving soundness in the faith and purity in the walk and conversation of church members. But yet, though ecclesiastical courts may proceed in an authoritative manner in the name of the head and king of Zion, their power and authority is limited. It is a power for edification. They have not a lordly and magisterial, but a ministerial and stewardly authority. They have not a legislative authority, though they have a power to declare and publish the genuine sense and meaning of the laws of Christ's spiritual kingdom, in opposition to corruptors and subverters of the same. They have a power to apply the doctrines of faith, or the truths of God declared and laid down in his word, against emergent heresies and errors. They have also a power to apply the censures of Christ's house to the erroneous and scandalous. They are not lords over our faith and conscience, they are not lords over our faith and conscience, excuse me, nor the rule of our faith and practice, but helps to both. All the office bearers in the church are given her, and consequently all ecclesiastical courts are instituted and appointed for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, verse 12. And according to our confession, chapter 31, parts 2, 3, and 4, but if ecclesiastical courts rule over the flock of Christ with rigor, if they refuse to publish and declare the laws and ordinances of the Lord Jesus in opposition to gainsayers, if they walk contrary to the laws of Christ's spiritual kingdom, or the instructions that they have received from him, if they wound, scatter, and break the heritage of God, if they screen and protect the erroneous or scandalous, if they turn the edge of the discipline if they turn the edge of discipline against such as cleave to the truth and testify against iniquity, then they are unfaithful to their trust, and pervert the key of the keys of judgment uh, the keys of discipline excuse me then they are unfaithful to their trust and pervert the keys of government and discipline and thereby forfeit their claim to the exercise of the keys till they repeat and return to their duty and it and in this case their power and authority may justly be rejected as tyrannical in its exercise by the subject by the subjects of Christ's spiritual kingdom and that this is the state of matters with respect to this national church as she is represented in her present judicatories is what I am now to evince, 
and I hope the short account of what is given, uh, I hope that the short account that is given above of our Presbyterian principles will not be judged foreign to the purpose in hand, especially when they are so much opposed even to some who not many years ago distinguished themselves by a zealous appearance for them, whereby some are in danger to be carried away under the sectarian extremes on the one hand, and on the other hand, many are losing fight of our Presbyterian principles, by reason of the conduct of the judicatories, who, though they bear the name and character of the Presbyterian courts, yet in the present exercise and administration of the government and discipline, do in their judicative capacity oppose themselves unto our Presbyterian form and order, and walk contrary unto the special end and design of the ordinances of government and discipline in the house of God, as may evidently appear from the following particular instances. First, that the present judicatories of this church are tyrannical in the administration, may appear from their conduct in the settlement of ministers and vacant congregations. There has been for about twenty years by past, and upwards a continued series and tract of violent settlements, whereby ministers have been introduced, uh, whereby ministers have been intruded upon dissent, dissenting and reclaiming congregations, as these violent settlements have been countenanced and supported by the authority of the supreme judicatory of this national church. So they have taken place, many of them, upon the footing of presentations in consequence of the act restoring patronages, and others upon the footing of the act passed by the Assembly 1732, anent the settlement of vacant congregations. It is plain that a legislative power and authority was exercised over the house of God in the passing of the foresaid act, whereby the flock and heritage of God were spoiled and robbed of the power of choosing and calling their own ministers, and this power was given up by her heritors under the general denomination of Protestants, by which means such as declare themselves opposite unto our Presbyterian constitution, were invested with the power of giving ministers to Presbyterian churches. The foresaid act was indeed repealed by the Assembly, 1734. But now, was it repealed? Was it declared to be sinful or contrary unto our Presbyterian principles and constitutions, as are asserted in our books of discipline or other laudable acts of this national church? Or was the above act declared to be a violation of the rights and privileges of the subjects of the King of Zion? No, by no means. It was only repealed because it was passed contrary to some forms appointed to be observed in the passing of acts of assembly. And therefore the settlement of ministers in uh, is to this very day carried on, either upon the footing of presentations or after the manner prescribed in the repealed act, and consequently the judicatories of this church not only justify that act in their practice, but by their habitual procedure in the settlement of ministers, counteract the ordinances and institutions of Christ, and exercise a lordly dominion over the heritage of God, whereby they are wounded, scattered, and broken. And this is done notwithstanding a manifold representations, notwithstanding of manifold representations and remonstrances to the contrary. The author of the essay owns that the violent that the charges of violent intrusions is what the Church of Scotland can least be vindicated from, page 30. He likewise acknowledges that we have just ground to lament the many violent settlements that have taken place. Quote, but, says he, as there hath been a considerable struggle made by many ministers of this church against them, a considerable stop hath been put to them for some time gone, unquote. It is time, it is true, excuse me, that both ministers and many other church members have made a, consider have made a considerable struggle against them, as may appear from the narrative I have given in the introduction, but then such as are strangers to affairs amongst us in Scotland, and who read the above words of our author, may readily apprehend that the struggles he mentions have had such desirable success that the present judicatories are repenting and reforming that course of violence which they have practiced against the Lord's heritage and flock in Scotland. But I appeal to our author himself if he can honestly say that the judicatories are either repenting or reforming their violence.